Welcome to another episode of Fueling the Tank. I'm Jeff Peterson, and with me today is somebody I've gotten to know in a whole bunch of different uh, types of positions. Uh, Phil's uh, been everything from kind of bringing up the entrepreneurial kind of mission for different companies all the way to uh, kind of heading up uh, sales for companies. But now he is in charge of growth for uh, Blue Line Battery. I wanna find out a lot about what your journey looked like and how you got into it because there's no way that you thought you were going to be uh, in charge of growth for an LED large battery for like forklifts and commercial settings. There's no way like that was in your head. So ladies and gentlemen though, let's welcome Phil to Fueling the Tank. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. And you're right. I, I had no idea I'd be working with a battery company in my late 20s. That wasn't on the vision board when I was a teenager. But... <laughs> and vision board. I mean, I didn't have a vision board. Did you really, Did you have a vision board or did you just no. use that term? Okay, no, good. not at all. My vision board <laughs> as a teenager was to try and play college hockey and make money. That was that was the two things. So college, so college hockey. Um, so were you playing hockey all the way from when you were? A really young kid? Yeah, I started skating at five, five or six. So started, I mean, when, as soon as you could walk practically and played through college. So hockey is, let's let's just face it. It is an absolute grind of a sport for kids because of ice time. It's expensive. Tournaments are all over the place if you're going to try to play competitive hockey. And if you wanted to be a hockey player someday, you were you playing like extra club hockey, off seasons and all that kind of thing? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's training almost every day. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the weight room, over summers, you're doing conditioning camps and always shooting pucks in the driveway. My, my parents' house, the garage is still peppered with dents oh, from hockey pucks shooting I'll at bet. the net, but missing And the neighbor's the net, window so. is probably still broken. Yeah. They just don't know about it. Oh, I never broke any windows. Really? But it's I, funny. I definitely I live, dented the garage. I live next door to um, uh, hockey players that are, are like looking for college uh, opportunities and they're playing for like uh, an Ad Admiral's summer league team and all that kind of stuff. And one day I, you know, I, I had my car parked on the side of the garage and on a little carport area. And uh, strangely, my passenger side window was shattered. I mean, I don't know. I mean, just randomly. Right. <laughs> and then I look around and I just see a whole bunch of like practice pucks, like just all over the place. Cause they had this net set up like in front of the garage. And I'm like, I just thought to myself, dude, if I send a picture of this to any college in the country, odds are you're not going. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's so funny because I think they were so oblivious because they're probably doing it at night. They probably just had one go awry on him yeah. and they didn't probably even realize where it went. And, uh, so I never told them, I just, I just had the freaking window fixed. I'm like, I don't want to, you know, shit on this kid's dream. So, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> That's so funny. See, the kid probably felt great because it's like, I finally broke something. I actually have some muscle now. <laughs> right, right. Because like, that had to have been a pretty decent shot. Yeah, I remember the first time we dented the garage door. I was like, whoa, I'm starting to get some power here. That's I, awesome. So what what position did you play on hockey? What did you like? Did you like offense, defense? Yeah, what was your I kind was, of thing? I was defense. I wasn't a skill player in terms of putting up points and scoring, but I was a great defensive defenseman. I made sure we didn't get scored on. So my my metric, if you will, was my plus minus score. Okay. In terms of if you were a defenseman or any player and you were on the ice and you were on the ice when the other team scored, that was a minus. But if you were on the ice when you scored, you got a plus. Okay. So I always wanted to have a, a plus rating. Okay. The higher the plus rating, the better a defenseman I was because it shows you're not getting scored on. How, at what age did you start to look at those metrics, those those kind of numbers in your head? Yeah, high school. Okay. At high school. Once you got to high school is when it, hockey really got serious. Yep. And for me, it, I wasn't good enough as a youth to like make it into the AAA system and junior admirals and all of that. Okay. If you were that good, you were starting to make – arrangements for what future hockey looked like right playing at a higher level of junior hockey and over high school instead right playing college maybe pros after that yep. i just wasn't that good as a kid so metrics really came in in high school and so it's like okay we're actually a real team this isn't just for fun and so what what personally like to wake up go through the hockey practice, putting on all the gear just just sweating like crazy taking it off going home still having to do homework as a kid all that what kept you motivated 
to keep wanting to do it? Like what made you not just say, this is a pain in the ass? Yeah. I mean, it was fun. I mean, sports are fun, but also the camaraderie of teammates. I mean, okay. being on a team and having your boys and your homies and that you're getting together, playing video games, you're spending time together. I mean, eventually we all find our tribe in life, right? Sure. Sometimes it's friendships, sometimes it's companies, sometimes it's bands, like, okay. but eventually you, you find your people that you resonate with and that you can be yourself around. Sure. That's your team. And eventually you build things together. So there's camaraderie, there's fun. I mean, it's really ultimately part of your identity as well. If you're on the sports team, right. you're wearing your hockey sweatshirt, you have pride wearing that around school. Like I'm on the hockey team. I've got number four. That's me. Right. So there's a lot that goes into your identity, which is challenging once hockey and sports is done. Right. When you have to take that jersey off and redefine who you who you are moving into new chapters of life, even when jobs end or when bands pack it up and right. put the drumsticks away, like finding your new identity throughout life is always an evolving process and challenge. So, and I'll, I'm going to jump all the way to where you are now, but I don't want to talk about what you're doing now, but I want to talk about just being in business. Now, take a look back at what hockey and the practices and the grind and the structure and everything. How did that kind of help you get through or position you or get you ready? mentally or just you know just trying to figure yourself out and figure out who you were yeah how did hockey play a part in that or or was it just sports yeah i mean it, i think it's a very true statement in life that you find no success or accomplishment without su extreme sacrifice and just unrelentless hard work yep. i mean you, nobody finds success from just landing in the right spot and it's gifted right i mean it comes from just dedicated hard work with hockey and everything school you have to get up you have to do the reps you've got to spend that those hours every single day working i don't think a lot of that really resonates with young people where it's like hey when you're old you've got eight to 12 hours a day that you have to work you can't be on your phone listening to podcasts right. or music like you actually need to sit down and type those email follow-ups yep. do cold reach outs to people and put yourself in uncomfortable positions like you have to grind to find success and ultimately stability in life so hockey played into that from just having a rigorous schedule, athletics and academics all kind of coincided with that same, just you're always working. You always right. have to, you can't take days off. Figuring out but, how to balance it all. But to segue that into business, I was also a teenage entrepreneur. Okay. So I had a woodworking business. I made custom furniture. I still do. So I love making tables and all kinds of crazy cool things for people. But as a teenager, I had a deck refinishing business. So in the summers, I was pressure washing and painting decks and gazebos, fences, kids' play sets, like anything that had wood that needed a new finish on it, that was outdoors. That was my business. Where did, did you get, where did that interest come from? So it was summer of, it was summer of 2009. So I was 15. Okay. There was no jobs. It was the top of the, you know, great recession, right. if you will. But I was 15, couldn't find work and needed mm -hmm. to start making money. My parents said, hey, you're not going to be sitting around playing video games right. all summer, like figure out how to make some money. So it started with doing chores, mowing lawns. And they said, go talk to the neighbors, go see if any of them need their lawns mowed. So I started doing that, helped my dad refinish the deck one weekend. The neighbor saw that and said, hey, would you guys do mine? My dad's like, no, I've got a job, but Phil sure, certainly will. And I was like, would you pay me? And he's like, yeah, how about, you know, 1500 bucks? I just did the math. I'm like, okay, $200 paint. I can make 1300 bucks in right. three days. Well, and the, and the big thing Done. about it is, is, when you can find, because I did something similar when I was in high school and didn't want, I didn't want to go get a job that was going to dictate the hours I had to work because I was in sports. So it wasn't, yeah, I didn't want to be the person. Yeah, I needed the flexibility and, but I wanted my own side, side cash and, and started doing it. So I was sealing driveways and washing windows. Yeah. There is, and, and it still is that way in life. It's, there is money in the niche business of services that other people can't do or don't want to do. Mm -hmm. There's money in that. Yeah. And and it's if if you're willing to put the time in, yes, if you calculated every minute, every hour, all that time that you personally spent in it, sometimes those projects that you made 1300 bucks if you calculate all the hours, maybe you made 11 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. And if you went and got a job, you could have made 14 bucks an hour. But you did it on your time, your schedule. You didn't have somebody breathing down your neck and you kind of yeah. had your own pride in it. It was for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think there's a big 
part of what you're talking about is as far as saying, you know what, you know, I'm cool with doing things in a labor fashion because I'm the one doing it. I'm the one that's getting something out of it. Cause, and I think that's a big growth opportunity just personally on future businesses and, yeah. and working for somebody else as well. Absolutely. But on that flexibility side too, that helped me attract talent. Yeah. I mean, cause I started hiring my buddies. So that first summer I was 15, couldn't drive. Right. So just work the neighborhood, just right. went door to door showing people, Hey, I just did Mike and Shirley's deck. I did that one. Yours looks like you need that too. Yep. yep. Not saying yours looks That's bad, how I but... did the driveway ceiling. As yeah. soon as you seal somebody's driveway, the next door neighbor's like, uh, how much would it yeah. take to do mine? Yeah. Everybody will just do the quick ask, mm -hmm. you know, especially because they think, oh, it's a kid. It's going to be cheap. Well, and you can, you can leverage that for yourself for sure. If it's some, you know, 36 year old walking up to your door saying, can I do your deck? They're like, who are you stranger adult? But if it's a kid, you're, you're not a threat. You're harmless. And you're, right. you can tug at that vulnerability. We're like, I would love to help you look at this young person that's working hard, but there's so much money to be made in those service businesses, yes. whether it's pressure washing, painting, window washing, mowing lawns, like you just got to do the work. But once you build up a base and you've got some clients, hire your friends and then yeah. just focus on actually growing the business. That was yeah. sort of my transition as I went from 15 as the owner operator to the owner with employees and buddies that were doing this work. And I just was doing the sales and managing the projects, checking in, managing clients. And that really helped segue me into being able to connect with adults as a right. teenager. Sure. And I've always been very, very comfortable with people that are older than me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I love the sort of tribalness of teenagers nowadays. Like they're so close to each other and they're such, they're such tight bonded friendships. Yep. But I, I, I struggle with seeing some interpersonal skills when it comes to like just going up and saying hi to adults and like networking and connecting. And you, you have to do that. Right. And the people that figure that out sooner will find success faster. Correct. I mean, when you can start making friendships and networking and not just networking, but just making friendships with other people. Yeah. I mean, it, sure, you're 21. It's weird to go talk to a 50 year old and say, hey, can we go grab lunch? But you'll learn something about yourself. Yeah. You'll connect with them and you'll stand out. And chances are they will then help you. They'll introduce right. you to people. If you say, hey, I want to find this type of job. Oh, I've got two friends that have companies that are looking for those types of people. That's actually how you find opportunities. I've never applied for a job in my life, Jeff. Yeah. Every single opportunity that I've had from my internship to my first job out of college to the last two, the last two startup companies I've run all came from networking. That's, I've never applied for a job. I've never I've, I, I just immediately started spinning in my head, thinking about all my jobs. I've applied for one, but it was through a personal connection to that job opportunity. So did I fill out an application? No, they called me in to talk to me, to meet me because they didn't know me, but offered me a job that day. So it, you know, that's, but that's the only time I ended up going and working for somebody from scratch that I didn't no, and I had to go meet them versus just getting jobs because, you know, hey, like come and work for me. Okay, it's a great opportunity. Boom, go work for them. You know, it's it's weird because, and I think everybody right now, if you're listening to this, think about how you got every job you ever had. And if you constantly had to fill out that job application and get put on a stack of paper on somebody's desk, and you were wondering how you're going to separate yourself from everybody else. The problem was you were in the stack of all the job applications. That's the first problem. So take it and start to realize you have to go meet people, have them get to know who you are. I say this all the time. There is a window of time for younger adults that you can ask anybody, any question as far as career paths, business opportunities. How much do you pay for this type of thing? How did you get started? What are the biggest challenges? There's a window of time mm -hmm. that people will answer those questions. Then when you start in your own career, like right now, you can go ask a whole bunch of people questions, but now that you're in a business and this and that, they might start looking at you and go like, well, you know, we kind of, you know, it's, it's like this, give you a surface answer. But when you're a kid, they think that you really should know all the truths and the answers so you can make decisions. Once you're in business, they start to wonder why you want to know about their business and they kind of keep things closer to the chest. So mm -hmm. take advantage of those, those, those times like you, like you clearly did. Yeah, I was, and, and I, and I, nobody told me that as a young person. I mean, my parents yeah. told me like, Hey, you've got to talk to adults. Like as yeah. a kid, like my, my parents never had money. Like, so I always had to go with them to work. So my dad was a lobbyist. He worked at a law firm in Madison around very, very high, powerful people. Sure. 
I, he, my parents told me, you cannot be a little snot when you're at the office. Right. When you see dad's boss, you go up to him, you look him in the eye and say, hi, Mr. Pronto, how are you? Right. Like, so as a young kid, my parents, you know, told me you have to be respectful to adults. Right. You have to be interpersonal and engaging. You can't just be the little kid hiding behind mom. You have to go up and yep. be interpersonal. But when I think about, you know, encouraging young people in network and what the type of directions they want to find in life, you know, it's easy to say, like, just go network, go meet people, just take that that leap of confidence and go talk to people. But I think a way to sort of filter first steps of what you should look for. Um, my, my degree is in economics. Mm -hmm. I love macroeconomics. We live in a very interesting world right now where there's new industries that are coming out every single day. Yep. I mean, from TikTokers to, I mean, electrification, the battery industry is exploding. The cannabis industry is exploding. Yep. Find things that you're interested in that you resonate with where it's like, okay, like we've got all of these gas cars, but everything's going to be electric in five to 10 years. Yep. I should go reach out. Elon to Musk is kind of uh, making that a big deal. Yeah, extremely. Right. But for young people, it's like, just find something that you take interest in, even if it's cannabis, like right. some other thing, like reach, there's hundreds of cannabis companies, go to LinkedIn, look up the marketing directors, whoever it is, yeah. send a message and say, Hey, I'm a student. I'm interested in this industry. Would you have time to connect for a zoom call? Hey, I'm just, just trying to ask to interview them yeah. about their company. So you get to learn about the company. Yeah. I mean, everybody will be like, sure. Yeah. Hey, I'm doing some research for uh, my own personal, you know, project and, and direction, you know, would you have 15 minutes for me to interview you? Yeah. And I mean, start your own podcast and yeah. use that as a way to interview all these different businesses, all these different people and, and work on your personal skills. Yeah. People will jump on a 15 minute podcast with Absolutely. a kid all day. And don't care about the metrics in no. terms of views, shares, any of that. That's no. irrelevant. Set a goal, hit 10 guests yeah. and then hit 50. But of those guests, those are now like super additions to your network. Yes. Because if you sat down with them, had a conversation yep. like this, you have a connection with that person. You've got a shared experience. You've got something that helped you stand out. So if you interview 50 people and you have a hundred listens, cause the only people that listened was your mom and dad. Yeah. Well, at least you had a 50 to a hundred conversations with right. people that could help you. Yep. And that you totally got agree with that. You've got a huge leap start on building a network compared to everybody else in your peer group. And with as simple as it is nowadays, to do that, start using it as, as a tool for your future now, you know, and, and, and go ahead and call it a project, you know, because it is, you know, it's a networking project, figuring out how to get to know people and what are some of the questions that you're comfortable answering. And if, if, you know, what questions do you think I should be asking you? You know, it, it's, it, it, that's a great question for a kid to ask an adult that's, a, that's been in their career. Like, what should I ask you? Like, I'm a kid. I don't know all the really good questions to ask somebody at your, like, what do you think I should know at my age to understand your business? Like, have them just, you, everybody use that question because yeah. that they have to tell you everything at that point. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. But I mean, that just developing that interpersonal skill yeah. to have a conversation, looking at people in the eye like this and not being uncomfortable. Yeah. Just being able to look someone in the eye is kind of an art nowadays, which is kind of yeah, incredible. Yeah, it's rare. It's rare. So, I mean, stand out just by being like what you should be human. Yeah. Just what you should be. It's like this, this shouldn't be hard. Yeah. Um, but yet it's, uh, and, and I don't know what, what do you think has changed or maybe not changed in the educational, you know, process that's making it not what it was. Cause I mean, I'm older than you, but we, I mean, as far as skill sets are, are we not getting this in grade school and high school and, and college for that matter. Are we getting any kind of training? Yeah. I mean, Did you? I, so I never had an online class. I never had to submit, like we would do like little quizzes and stuff online sure. from home. Like, so, and that wasn't until really college yep. for me that I had any sort of digital connectivity to education. Yep. My sister, so I'm 28, my sister's 19. When she was in grade school, she was given an iPad. Yeah. So all of her, I mean, textbooks. Homework. I was given a spiral notebook. Yeah, same here. <laughs> same here. I preferred legal pads. I like flipping over instead of yeah. side to side. That's just me. I still use legal pads. Like I refuse to like go fully digital. Like almost everything is digital, right? From how yeah, we message everything. out to connect. But everything. I still love having like a notebook that I write things down. Yep. Like a connection to a real pen. Like I, I just, I love that. But my sister's education was all digital. Yeah. It was all online. And 
there is something to be had around being in a room with 25 other people and having the teacher present and have you come up and write on the board and explain your logic. Like, right. I mean, we, we live in a digitally native world, but we're not cyborgs yet. Like we right. are still human beings. Like, right. like Neuralink isn't here. Glasses where your just mind communicates with the interface isn't there yet. Thankfully. I, I, mean, I just had a podcast with, uh, with Jesse Cole and Jesse is one of the best at sending thank you notes, like old school, boom, on his own stationery, sends a thank you note personalized to the point where it's about some type of connectivity between the, the two of him and the person that he sent a thank you note to. It's not just some form letter style thank you note. Mm -hmm. And when you get that from somebody, it's like, wow, somebody like actually took the time and wrote a thank you note put a stamp on an envelope and mailed it yeah. like the extra effort, which is not a lot of effort though. I mean, if right. you think about it, it's not a lot of effort, 10 but, minutes but who's, but who's doing it? Like nobody's doing it. So how do you stand out? How do you be different? And I think this, this is kind of where your, I think your career started right when you started doing the neighbor's deck. Oh yeah. Like yeah. your entire business mentality started there and the hockey world simply built a relationship to time management, the importance of showing up, being coached, being coachable, being a leader, being a self motivator. That's all part of the learning process. You didn't learn how to stain or refinish a deck in school. No. You know, and all of those other skills that came with it. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here dissing on the educational process. I'm just saying, if you're, if you're really going to think about your career and what you want to do in your business, a lot of that has to start personally. Yeah. You can't just go to class and think you're prepared for the world after right. education. You can't. No. Well, and for me, the big thing with sport and hockey, the big thing I took away from that was teamwork and yeah. leadership. I mean, so I, I run a startup company, the last company before this, I ran another startup before that I was advising companies. Right. And which is, which that's, that's how we got to know each other. Yeah. Right. When you were with G beta. Yeah. When I was with generator. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately like teamwork and leadership, a big part of that came from hockey because when you're in a startup company there, it, it, it's kind of glorified in the media and in a lot of places that it's this great thing. It's full of money. You see the headlines where it's like startup raises. $15 million, blah, right. blah, 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 blah. Well, it takes five years to get to that point yeah. where there's money that actually comes in. And those first five years are a gauntlet. It's kind of hell. There's no money. There's it's, it's, a, it's hell. It's, it's, a, it's a grind. The ones that just all of a sudden hit it and pop. I mean, that is yeah. a billion to one. I yeah. mean, it really is like our CEO of the current company, blue line battery, like this guy hasn't taken pay in years, right? Trying to figure out like where to, find cash to be able to pay for food and things yep. here and there. I mean, but now we've got a business that's generating millions of dollars of revenue. Yep. We're bringing in serious investor capital, yep. but to get to the point where we were an attractive investment, where we right. have a unique product, a market that's ready for it, a financial plan that shows how we're going to grow and be sustainable. Yep. Key teammates and met right. team members that have bought in. I mean, there's 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 15 metrics, 50 metrics that need to be checked off before somebody is going to write you a check right. for ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand right. dollars, two million right. to invest in your business. And startups, I mean, it's it's it is unicorn hunting to some extent. Yeah. Like, but to get to that phase where you can get your first million dollars of investor capital, I mean, you need to bring your own capital into the business just so that you have sufficiency to pay your bills, pay yourself, right. pay your people. I mean, these are really expensive ventures with a very high probability of failure. Right. I mean, it is, it, and it takes. And, and it's not, and, and let's, let's just kind of say this really quick. The high probability of failure might have nothing to do with the product. Right. The product might be fantastic. It, it, it just doesn't only rely on how good the product is. It has to do with the, again, going back to the networking, the getting, having people even know it exists, Yeah, you know, that entire challenge of it, getting the time of people, um, and the money to keep it going yeah. to get it to that next level. And it's, you can have the best, I mean, can you even imagine the number of amazing products that failed just because, right? like literally Timing. just because, right? Well, I, there was a, there was an, so we're currently 
closing out a seed round of capital. We're raising somewhere around $3 million. Yep. One of the investors that we were doing diligence with, they ultimately didn't participate in this round, mm -hmm. but we spent a lot of time together, got to know his history, his background. And he shared a story with us where he was in San Francisco. This was 90s or 80s, very early on. Yep. And he he's an engineer and writes software. And he was essentially being recruited to join a team of founders that were doing peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Well, yep. it pivoted into that, but I think they were doing like institution to institution transactions. They had software that could facilitate transactions and the flow of money significantly faster than any other thing in the world. But the use case that they were going after between like institutions and business to business just wasn't right. So we walked away from that and said, I'm not gonna join this team. Six months later, that business pivoted their model and that became PayPal. Right, yeah. Isn't that he could have worked with wonderful? Elon Musk and yeah, Peter wonderful? Thiel, like, yeah. and he would uh -huh. have been a, a gazillionaire, gazillionaire. Right. But to your point around timing, thankfully that business pivoted and became PayPal. Right. But the product is ever evolving. I mean, right now at Blue Line, we've got basically like version nine of yeah. our battery that's now finally ready to be adopted at scale in terms of reliability. Yep. Lithium forklift batteries is just a simple use case have been in existence for five to 10 years. Sure. But adoption rate has really plateaued at 2%, 3% because they're just not reliable. They fail. You have to ship them back to the factory to get them fixed. But now our new version, you can fix it in five minutes, 10 minutes if it right. goes down because we've got this modular swapping ability. But that's version like nine oh, yeah. of our product evolution so the, the over fact five that, years. The fact yeah. that um, Blue Line even got to version nine. It's a miracle. It's a, it's, it it's really a, is. It's a real miracle. I mean, it's the grind and the, and the, the, the drive of, of that team. And at that point, smaller team. You know, Very. just really trying to figure this out and believing and seeing where the future could go. And right now, version nine, and, and how long have you been with Blue Line Battery? So I've been in it. I was an advisor to the company before joining full time. So I've been with Blue Line for about three and a half years okay. as an advisor okay. on strategy and venture capital. Yep. And I joined full time about five months ago, six months ago. And what made you? So you came up. So you're with Generator yep. doing the whole. Um, the, st the startup advising, kind of going through the workshop, the what's important, building a business plan, how to present, fine tuning directions of these startups. That's kind of what the generator yeah. world was, which in reality, I mean, you were probably guiding, but learning massively from every one of these situations because every yeah. situation for every style company is a learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about going and getting an MBA, a oh. big part of that is reading case study right. and reading the case study of dozens of businesses and learning from the, the paths that other people walked. In my role at Generator, I was hired and I was paid to provide two services, to find startups and to help them hone in their strategy right. for growth. And then my second task was to connect them with investors right. and customers and to try and help their businesses grow. And this was in real time, real businesses. Yeah. I mean, so I was a direct advisor to about 24, 25 companies in my two years, two and a half years yep. with Generator and indirectly working with hundreds of other startups within the Generator network, yep. helping to join in on team meetings, offer advice here and there. You've but got 37 master's degrees. In a way. Yeah. I, mean, it's, I, I feel like I, I have paid. a BR, not, a, not an MBA. I've got a BR, business reality. Well, it's real time case study. <laughs> right. Like here's a project that we think could be something. Let's go try and make it happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I, I can't say enough about generator and the work they're doing. And just as a young person coming into an opportunity like that, where you're given a platform right. and access to startups that are trying to make stuff happen yep. and access to a network of investors that are established, like to just have that access and to be able to have that opportunity to try and make shit happen. Yeah. Like, where else can you find that? And right. It was and, and, an and amazing you, you, role. You sit, there, you sit there and you look across the country and you've got um, so many, like there was a buzz. You know, the, the entrepreneur buzz, the uh, co-working space buzz, the startup buzz. There was a period of time that it was just really trendy. Sure. The ones that have made it out of just being, because there was a billion of them that right. were jumping in trying right. to be that. And now 
I, I feel like it's become more focused, more less clutter of a whole bunch. And the ones that were really truly strong and cared about the businesses that were going through it and keeping the network strong and not just trying to make a buck off of everybody that mm -hmm. came through it. Um, are like now, if you go to those, these types of companies, like generator now is like so much stronger than it was back then because the, the clutter has gone. The reality of it is, so you've got these investors that really know that what these businesses are going through is going to make their investment a safer investment. Right. Well, and two generator has created outcomes. Oh yeah. I mean, right. it's not just fluff i wonder, hey, I wonder what their percentage is because yeah you know percentage of startups that actually succeed and what and what does succeed mean you know they could still be around a, a startup could be around for 15 years but it's just like kind of paying that person's you know mortgage payment and health mm -hmm. insurance and food on the table that might be successful for that person so right. it's like hard to judge it sure. but maybe if they're still in existence what percentage of the businesses that have gone through generator like are still in existence yeah I mean, they which, update which counts. They update those metrics on that website. Yep. I mean, every day, and not just. There's a ton of metrics. It's total dollars raised. Yep. It's total number of companies that have been sold or acquired. They also track, you know, metrics on number of, you know, female founders, minority founders. So they're very, very focused yeah. on helping build the diversity the, of, of building business. equity. Yeah. Right. So they're they're very focused on their metrics. But the the G there's two programs really within Generator between the equity program where they actually invest. Right. So typically more later stage startup, usually over a hundred thousand of lifetime revenue. Yep. Like they've got a product, they're ready to take that next big step. Yep. And then you've got the stage before that where it's companies trying to get to that level. Right. And that's really where G beta focus. Yep. But the G beta program has expanded into to dozens of cities. Okay. I mean, so I ran the Beloit program and this was back 2017. Now the program started in Madison, Milwaukee. Beloit was the first expansion program. Yep. So there was a, the first program that they ran, there was another program manager before me. I came in and ran the second program. Yep. And now this program has expanded from just Madison, Milwaukee, Beloit to it's something like 30 to 50 cities yeah, around the country. Yeah, it's crazy. And yeah. that wouldn't have it's happened awesome. if it wasn't for companies raising money, creating jobs, and then ultimately being acquired. There's, it's, I want to say the number of, uh, of capital that's been raised from G-Beta alumni is like 170 million. It's, ins it's something yeah, wild. It's and I, uh, they report it. You can find it on the website, but yeah. it's well over $100 million. That's awesome. In a five-year period, four-year period since the program's been yeah. launched. So there's real outcomes it's helping flow it's a great capital. it's a great vetting yeah. filtration program for investors right well and ultimately a lot of these these startups all whether they want to admit it or not you need some help with pitching yeah for sure and getting getting your business down because we i could take 10 hours with you and walk you through blue line yeah but if i've got you in the room listening to me i really have 90 seconds to capture your attention if i meet that sort of point in time. You've earned a little bit more. I've earned a little bit more. <laughs> right. Now I've got five minutes. Yep. If I can keep the pitch going and make things interesting, maybe I get an hour, maybe yeah, I get the, a half hour. It, it starts like, okay, when am I going to get it to a point where they ask me a question? Yeah. Because once they ask you that first question, they actually give a shit about what you're talking about. And then it becomes a conversation, not a pitch. Yeah. And that's, Absolutely. that's the trick of it. Yeah, That's and you have trick. to get past that initial barrier yeah. of getting to a place of comfort where they trust you and they feel interested to engage. But to be able to communicate the 10,000 things that you want to say about your business from the product to the market, competitive landscape, performance, IP. I mean, there's a thousand things you could talk about. What is the first sentence you say? What are the first two bullet points that you want to hit right. on? Do you even understand your competition? Can you even communicate why your product is better? Or what's your unique sauce? Like there's so much that goes into just succinctly communicating business opportunity. And that's really one of the big services that Generator, you know, coached me on, trained businesses on. And that's ultimately what's driving a lot of those outcomes. These people know how to talk about their businesses. Yep. They know how to communicate with, to investors. We've actually found some startups that have a real opportunity. It's not some phantom thing they're right. chasing. And ultimately that's key to getting that capital to flow to those new opportunities. With, with as much as your personality, like literally that was like almost like a job built for Phil. Like that was that, that concept of that, that guiding, that, um, working with and, you know, kind of being a team, a teammate to those businesses, that job was 
had to have been very energizing for you. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. It was great. My, and I, I would still love to be like in that role because it's just so much fun. Right. But I also love like operating business yeah. and growing something that right. I'm managing. So with advising, you know, two dozen companies over a couple of years, there's only so much like time that there's you can this, give there's to this each like you're them. constantly handing them off. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like fostering a, a, a dog that, you know, just has their puppies and all of a sudden, you know, you've got the puppies for eight weeks and you're like, okay, now it's time for you to go up for adoption yeah. at the, at the humane society. Yeah. And it's like, so I did my job, but it, it, when do I get to just do my thing myself instead of doing all of this and handing it off, doing all yeah. this and handing it off? Well, and to some extent too, like, so I was I was itching to get into the trenches. Like sure. being an advisor, you're in this you're in the safety place. Yeah, like you don't have if skin they in if the they game, if they shit the bed. Help. Yeah, you know they shit the bed. I and still you, get and you, my payment. You wake up like, the next day yeah. and talk to another company. Yeah, exactly. So to some extent, you know, I'm I'm advocating to these companies to take risks and to try out these different decisions without having skin in the game, and you almost kind of feel like a hypocrite to some extent, where you're like, okay, I'm helping guide the decisions you're making but I have no skin in the game. It doesn't affect me personally. I was itching to get into an operator seat by the end of my like two and a half years there, yep. which, you know, one of the companies that I was advising helped them raise a round of capital. And then they brought me in as their director of growth. That's awesome. So did that for a couple of years. So that was, what industry was that? Cause that's interesting. Yeah. So this company was in, was in the, was in the extraction industry but they would work with organic plant materials. So the founder of this business, the, the company is called American Extractions. The parent company is called Simply Solutions. And the, the founder and owner CEO of this business is just a straight up super scientist. Yep. That, that's so, the guy grew up in a NASA lab, like his dad was a NASA engineer. This guy's got dozens of patents and things of unique IP and technology that have that all really have some level of commercialization potential. Sure. So we, one of the technologies was a way to extract molecules from plant material while doing it naturally and organically, but also, I mean, purifying the molecule. So for one of the examples, CBD was a compound we would extract. Yep. Now I said compound because it's multiple molecules. CBD has excess electrons. So the size of the molecule or compound, if you will, is somewhere around like 2,400 nanometers. It's tiny. But the molecule of CBD is bonded to fat. Phil, we went from refinishing a deck <laughs> to fucking molecules and to science, to sci like science, like high level, like science. When, when do you think, like, how did you adapt into this? I'm, I'm a naturally curious person. Like I'm, I'm, I love learning. I'm, I'm fascinated by a lot of things. My, so my dad was a lobbyist and still is sure. my mom is in the Madison like fine arts community. If yeah, you've yeah. ever seen uh, Christmas Carol at yeah. the Overture Center, she's choreographed that production for 30 years. So she is very, very artistic, directs, plays, musicals, is a dance teacher at MATC. I mean, just an absolute like amazing person in the yeah. fine arts community. So growing up in a very like artistic household where my parents just encouraged me to explore whatever interests I had and mm -hmm. to double down on that. If this week I was into dinosaurs, my mom had five books from the library. We're learning about dinosaurs. The next week, if I'm interested in trains, well, we've got five VHSs rented from the library to yeah. learn about trains. So as a young person, my, my mind was just sculpted around anything I find curiosity in. Yep. Like it just is like a double, triple down yep. effect into it. So any of these use cases, unique technologies, unique applications, like I'm just, I'm ready to learn all about it and to try and figure it out. That way I can communicate it succinctly yeah. to people to be able to help almost translate like, okay, here's the 50 pages of this science. Right. Here's the five bullet points you need to know. Yeah. But ultimately this, this company had a, an ability to take big compounds and, and cut off the stuff you don't want. So those fat molecules that were on the CBD molecule, sure. they could purify it. They would get rid of those electrons and you would have just the CBD molecule which was down to like the 12 to 24 nanometer size, which is where pharmaceutical drugs lie that are produced, you know, synthetically. So in the, in the world of, let, let me, let me try to just say this. It was an organic pharmaceutical company. And, and you're, you're basically saying, Hey, if you're going to do CBD products, you can do it with all that lesser quality material 
or you can use ours that we've kind of filtered it through to make it a higher quality. Is that really in the end what was going on? I mean, not or am to, I way off? No, hundred percent. If and not to make like a silly reference, but like you could go with the half baked CBD that was done with inferior extraction, yep. or you could go with the organic Fully pharmaceutical. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, don't take too much. It's right. so pure. Like it right. makes it more powerful. It makes it more bioavailable. Like so, it, does it make it more cost effective? Even though the process was more in depth yes because you don't have to use as much it's more cost effective by bringing in a higher quality product yeah for a lot of reasons so your cost let's go on a cost per gram basis okay. your cost per gram is lower so with other extraction technologies they would get maybe 50 percent yield 60 percent. so if you had say 10 pounds of hemp yep. and there's 10 percent cbd concentration they're getting a half a pound American extractions would get a full pound. They had like 95% extraction. Yep. So the throughput was significantly more. Sure. So your cost per gram was less. So it was a more affordable product and it was more pure. It was just better off. But I worked with that business for two years. We took that from pre-revenue to a place of early profitability, a couple of rounds of capital. We took that product and service to market right as the pandemic was happening. Oh. So our initial product was selling to retailers Immediately, all of those doors were closed for practically six months to and, a year. And the, and the fear, because I'm in the world of e-commerce, the fear on that was it's like, oh, you can go online. Nah, like you can't go to Amazon because Amazon wasn't letting a lot of those products on yeah. because they were, they're afraid right now of certain mm -hmm. strains, certain this, certain, that, certain verbiage, all right. of that, because they don't know what's going to be legal in this state versus that state and all the rest of it. So they've right. got to put a broad market generalization to it. So a lot of the products like that can't be sold on Amazon. Right. So if brick and mortar retail is shutting down on you and you don't have the largest e-commerce platform and most other e-commerce platforms, you know, followed suit with Amazon and that you either are selling it on your own website and hoping for the best, but does anybody know you exist yet type of a thing? Yeah. Well, and that's where we found customers was people that was that were selling direct online through yeah. Shopify, all these yep. platforms, and we were able to generate revenue. I mean, it Tough. when when the world throws a crazy thing in your face, it's not a problem; it's an opportunity. Figure out where the opportunity lies. Right now, with our current business with Blue Line Battery, supply chain is an absolute huge problem. Right, like all of our competition, whether it's lead acid batteries or our lithium competitors have six to 12 month backlogs where all of the distributors of these batteries to end users like Geneva Supply or anybody right. else, they haven't been able to get their hands on batteries almost all year. Yeah. So right now what's fascinating for Blue Line is we can actually get the components we need, but because of that modular system, our manufacturing throughput is exponentially faster than our competition. Goes back to their batteries are centralized. Every battery is custom manufactured. Sure. Our batteries now have a Lego brick on the inside that we can just build the Lego bricks and then build a battery. So having that system where we can just make one skew of an internal component and then from that pull them off of an inventory and make finished batteries, there's probably three to five skews of batteries in the forklift industry that make up 80% of the lion's share of revenue. We've called our distributors and they've said, if you can get us these three skews, or if you have that inventory, we will sell it immediately like today. So for us, instead of going to the market and saying, hey, here's the 350 batteries right. we can make. We're just going to hey, focus. Go where, the, go where the need is right now. Go the, where the three SKUs that we can produce at scale with our manufacturing right. partner. Make hundreds of units of inventory. Go to those distributors and say, hey, we've got 100 of this model. Yep. They'll be gone in the next 48 hours because we're calling the 50 other people like you right. that haven't been able to get your hands on this for six months to a year. Yep. If you want some sales, here's your chance. Right. So for us, it's an opportunity because sure. we can actually make product instead of being like a custom order company and just taking in orders and manufacturing them over time. We're going to actually start driving inventories, which has never happened. The lithium forklift battery industry has done over 500 million of revenue in the last five to 10 years. Every single one of those batteries that have been sold have been custom and manufactured to order. So every battery hasn't come from inventory, it's come from custom manufacturing. But for us, when you think about a standardized product, the ability to make a ton of that, right. and a market that hasn't been able to make any sales all year, 
in terms of those distributors, we can go to them with a lifeline right now where they're like, oh, we can actually drive some revenue before the end of the year. We can actually, wait, you can get us a battery in a week. Right. I thought everybody else is six months. Well, and I think, I think business, anybody that's in business right now, that's listening to this, this is almost a outline of how to rethink your current, your current distribution, your current manufacturing, your current sales strategy. It's looking for the niche opportunities as they arrive, focus in, create the efficiencies on those because everything else might still exist, but it might just not be the time to focus in on those. And you, you have to be ready to piece out the strengths and opportunities as, as they rise. Yeah. And I, I think that's a great way to kind of, you know, explain like why you did what you did. And some of it is just like, Hey, you can't sell what you don't have. Right. You know, so how are we going to present this? And I love the creating, you know, the, the buzz and the need for your product during a time like this. It's like, Hey, it, it's a reality. You yeah. do, you did only have a hundred and you are going to have to call the next 50 people because you've got to generate income. Right. But for them, it's like, Oh crap. All right. I've, I can't sit there and push this off for 30 days, 60 days and tell them I'll think about it because they start to have a realization of, of what those needs and, and inventory levels are like mm -hmm. nowadays. Right. Um, so it's, but what, if we could go back and, and just say, what is energizing you to keep you at blue line? Now I know this is weird. Cause I don't want, all right, I'm going to apologize right now to everybody at blue line for asking this <laughs> question to Phil, but it's more of a, it's yeah. more of a personality. I'm going to put you on the spot and I don't mean to, but I do. Cause I want to, your personality is so energized by getting companies to where they need to be that you get them there. What's going to keep you energized to stay there. Right. And, and, and I say yeah. this not about blue line. Sure. I say this about Phil waking up and, and staying energized. You've got all of these experiences you've gone through your life. You are a person that self-assesses and, and looks back to see who you are. You know who you are personally, probably more yeah. than a lot of people do. What makes you stay at a company? What keeps you energized? What do, what do they need to give you? Not dollars, just what needs to feed you yeah. to keep you to stay motivated and energized at a company? Yeah. That's a tough question. I haven't yeah. thought about that. That's a good question. Um, well, one of the areas that Blue Line is really, really unique for me, and it goes back to hockey, interestingly enough, is is teammates. Yep. So our company is all young people. Yep. I mean, our founder and CEO, Dustin, he's 30, 31, was just on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. I mean, Kristen and Ben on our team, they were just on the 25 under 25 list. Yep. 2017 or whenever it was, I was on the I'm, 25 I'm waiting for, under 25 I'm, I'm waiting list. for the 54 under 54 yeah. list. <laughs> And I got to hurry up because I'm going to be 54 in December. <laughs> I, I hope someday to be on the 60 over 60 list. But yeah, but <laughs> 60 over 60. Yeah, that's but it. but I mean the people on the team they're 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 my homies. Like yeah. at the end of the day, like Ben and Kristen and I, we all live together in like a startup house. Yeah. Like I don't know if you've seen Silicon Valley, the sh TV show, but there's like a startup incubator house. To some extent, we kind of have that going on. Is with that Blue the Line. house you've been remodeling in Beloit? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, and that's the old the old mayor's mansion of Beloit. Historic home built in 1885. Goes back to your woodworking. Yeah, it goes back. So I'm renovating an old Queen Anne Victorian home with a ton of history. We gutted the first floor. So I did in 2020, outside of the startup stuff, I'd renovated the horse carriage for my woodworking studio. So that's where I do all my woodworking. Yeah. It's out in the garage. So I did that last year when everybody was at home. And this year I have been remodeling the first floor, but I salvaged all of the original trim and behind trim, I found old financial documents from the 1800s. Oh. I mean, just incredible history from right. this, this, this mayor's house. So I love that history of the home, but my teammates at Blue Line, like we're all just so unbelievable, all in. All in. Yeah. I mean, we're so invested into seeing this business through that. You know, there's that will keep me yeah. at Blue Line. Yep. I really love this product specifically. I love selling it. It's a big category. I mean, Blue Line should have remarkable success in five to 10 years. It could be one of the largest companies in Wisconsin, yep. realistically, just looking at the marketing competitive landscape. So for me, I've, I've been looking for a while to find a place to land yep. to help take a business from, hey, 
hundred thousand of revenue mm-hmm. to ten million, yep. and then eventually a hundred million, yep. and then five hundred. So I want to be able to have a a good run five ten years with a business and say, hey, when I started, you know, we were a million bucks of revenue. Yep. And we grew this business to a billion dollars. Like I want to have one of those big stories to share. And I've been looking for that for a long time. I saw dozens and dozens of startups through my time with Generator and was always looking for the one that I think was really going to pop. Right. And American Extractions was one that I bet on. Yep. And I had no intention of leaving there. Right. I really loved my role, what we were doing, what we were accomplishing, but but Blue Line needed help. Yep. And I and they were my friends. And I knew that what they were looking for was what I could accomplish for yep. them. And if it wasn't going to happen, the business was going to die. Right. I mean, not to be so morbid, but just with the financial limitations of where the business yeah. was earlier this year, it, it would have been out of business at this point in time had yep. I not come in and brought in capital and resources. Thankfully, we've got new partnerships with manufacturing, which alleviates working capital constraints. Right. That business can help us scale into the 100 million revenue figure range. We've got new investors that have come in and recapitalized the business. And it all happened very, very quickly and it needed to. to. Yeah. So for me, it was uh, it, it was something I had to do to join the team. Like I needed to make sure that Blue Line was going to be successful. Yep. And we're really moving and grooving now. Like it's been a good four or five months. It's been tough. Hey, it's, it's, I a, mean, it's, a, great, it's a great story, a great journey just in that five months period of time. I mean, you're going to look back in a year and be like, oh my gosh, I just did five years worth of worth of work, yeah. you know, in a year's time. And and I think that's, you know, in, in keeping uh, Phil Funfair on on staff as part of a team, that it, that's the energy, the camaraderie, the purpose, the people. It's not just about it. So much of it, everybody thinks it's about the money. So much of it's not. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not. It's, um, it's, it's about moving forward and continuing to move forward and, and good on you blue line for, you know, getting this guy on board. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, always know that I'm going to have a really solid conversation. Anytime I talk to you, it's going to be, there's going to be meaning and substance behind it. Um, and, uh, I, thanks for being part of the podcast. It was great to kind of catch up and hear a little bit more of the details of, of where you've gone and what you've been up to. So Thanks for being on. Of course. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. It's it's great to catch up and hang out for a bit. And anytime, happy to come back and just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Good stuff. This was Phil Fair. I'm Jeff Peterson. This is Fueling the Tank. Peterson, out.